Dr. Scott Jensen is on with us uh, now. Hello, doctor. How are you? Good, Glenn, and thank you for having me on. Sure. Uh, so we have some another doctor who is probably going to disagree with you uh, uh, on next, but I want you to build the case of why people should or should not wear a mask. What, what is happening here? What's the science say? Well, Glenn, let me take one step back and make certain that I do a disclaimer and say that I am not a material science engineer, and I'm mm -hmm. trying to provide reckless advice, and I'm not trying to spread misinformation because I've been investigated by the mortem medical practice because I was willing to compare COVID-19 and influenza, and that was reckless advice, and I was willing to discuss how we do death certificates, and that was spreading misinformation. But the good news is I learned late yesterday afternoon that the Board of Medical Practice in Minnesota has dismissed those charges, and so they're gone, and I'm very grateful good for, you. for that. But Good. I understand that you want to talk about masks, and I, I think that if we would have talked about this a couple months ago, we might have said, well, there's the science of masks, and there's the emotions of masks. But unfortunately, there's something in between, because I would have thought that the science of masks would have to do with the physics of masks. And so I did a video about a month or so ago where I talked about the pore size of a cotton mask or a surgical mask, and if you have a triple-ply mask, and the pore size will end up being effectively five microns and five microns uh, to a COVID-19 virus particle is 50 times larger and that's approximately the same differential between the two inch uh, separation between the wires on a chain link fence and a gnat so if you have 50 gnats they could squeeze into a, a chain link fence and you could have 50 COVID-19 viral particles squeezed into that five micron pore so I thought well, that would sort of lay out the science but it's not because now what we're saying well if we have some collision of COVID-19 viral particles with the lattice work of any mask wouldn't that be a good thing and I think that's intuitive that if you're breathing out or breathing in and viral particles collide with the actual lattice work of a mask I think intuitively yes I think we could reduce the amount of viral particles that's going back and forth on June 12th Dr. Mike Osterholm uh, put out a video on masks, and he was very clear that he thought they had very little effect, and the damaging effect might be that people would lull themselves into thinking that they're protected when, in fact, they're not. I did a right. video the other day at Target, and I watched this little kid pick his nose, rub his eyes, and then stick his fingers in his mouth. And then he was taking his mask off, and his parents were giving him a hassle. And I thought, this is nuts. So I really don't think, Glenn, that we're going to be able to walk this back. The science of masks will not be the determining factor. I think the emotion and the desperation and the deep-seated desire to do something, anything, to make sure we're not killing grandma has taken over the discussion. So uh, let's just talk about different kinds of masks. N95 masks, are they the best? Well, that's an, that's an excellent question. The governor of Minnesota put out an edict on last Thursday that masks were mandatory in public places inside and and that took place Saturday three days ago in it the executive order actually identifies that the N95 mask with an exhaust valve on the front of it is not an acceptable mask and many N95 masks have that exhaust valve and all that means is that you are going to filter the air that you breathe in but the air that you breathe out is not filtered at all it just blows right on through so that mm -hmm. kind of N95 sort of takes care of the wearer, but not the other. And that is a pretty good so, mask because that, that filters uh, mic, uh, 0.3 micron particles. And so that's pretty effective. But the other two masks don't have anywhere near that capacity. Well, the, the, the problem is, is that we, you don't see anybody with an N95 mask. What you're seeing now are these masks that people are making themselves out of cotton. And uh, that, I mean, that's nowhere near an N95 mask. Nowhere near at all. It's, I mean, the gaps at the top underneath your eyes. Actually, I had a patient in the other day wearing an N95 mask, and the poor guy didn't realize that you're supposed to put the upper margin of the N95 mask underneath your eyeglasses. He had it resting on top of his actual lenses. He had great big chasms where viral particles would flow. People need to remember, airflow goes where there's least resistance. So if there's an opening, that's where all the airflow is going to go. I mean, we know that from physics. But it was interesting, Glenn. I had my first three patients today, one had uh, emphysema. The other one had 
congestive heart failure, and the next one had emphysema. And every one of them complained bitterly about the shortness of breath they're having with their mask. So I think that what we're going to see is we've got this movement right now that masks are something that we can do, that we can take an action. Fair enough. Okay. But we are going to see unintended consequences. We are going to see the risk of what happens when you breathe in and out your own viral particles, your own bacteria, that normally you would exhale and they would be gone from you. Now you're sort of keeping them in this cup. And then to get to your point about these kerchiefs and the things people are wearing, they've become increasingly liberalized in the sense that they wouldn't even be called a mask. I mean, it's a scarf. And a lot of people pull it up and pull it down. Their nose is always sticking out. Mm -hmm. Now become a badge. Like you said, if you don't wear it, you know, maybe you'll get pepper sprayed. If you do wear it, you're complying with the state edict. Uh, the, you, you talked about the people that are in your, uh, practice that came in. There is a, a sign that we saw. Do we have a picture of this sign that we saw of a place, a restaurant that said, um, even if you have a disability, you have to wear a mask, um, here. Well, I mean, if you do have problems, I mean, I wouldn't go there. I mean, the, the obvious answer is don't go there. But if more and more people have this, a disability of being able to breathe or not breathe because of a mask, if this becomes an edict or spreads, that's really bad for some people, is it not? You're absolutely right, Glenn. It's terrible. I'm looking at this one patient's chart in her late 70s, congestive heart failure. She goes out probably once a month to try to get groceries. She tries to wear a mask. When I walked in to see her in the office, her blood pressure was 190 over 70. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. Blood pressure. She didn't know. She said, I just don't breathe very well with this mask. I said, well, take the mask off. I needed to have her take the mask off anyway because I wanted to examine her throat, her pharynx, and her nose, and this kind of thing. Anyway, 10 minutes later, I took her blood pressure. It was down to 158 over 60. This is happening all the time. This is what we do when we overreact and do these knee-jerk reflexes and take this cookie-cutter approach. We're always compelled to find down the road the unintended consequences. We have to stop pretending that uh, politics is religion and we're fighting over nonsense. I personally wear a mask when I go out. I don't know if it's all that effective, but I do wear it when I go out. Uh, I just, I think it's uh, courteous. Uh, to wear one and if it will help you know just if it will help one person well then I've done my job Um, I I don't know how effective it is and that's why we are having a conversation between a couple of doctors uh, today and we're going about to uh, join a third uh, that is talking about masks whether or not they're effective in the way we're doing it N95 masks make sense to me Um, they made sense to me when they were telling us that masks don't make a difference I saw that as a way for everybody to stop buying masks so you could get enough at the hospital because it seemed to work at the hospital. Um, But uh, the masks that, for instance, that I wear, that my wife has made and so many people are making, is this just um, the uh, kind of the last hurrah of masks? Does it do anything? We're talking to... uh, uh, We're talking to Dr. George Rutherford, epidemiology professor at UCSF. Do those handmade cotton masks make any difference or a scarf around your face? Yeah, as long as you put it over your nose, it makes a difference. That You know, people who wear these underneath their nose, like there's some, you know, <laughs> some, some, you know, half-baked bank robber, you know, that doesn't work. You know, you're, you exhale through your, you inhale and exhale through your nose. So we're trying to yeah. do three things. Well, first of all, we're trying to protect the people around you in case you're one of the 40 percent of people to 60 percent of people who have asymptomatic infection and don't know it the second thing we're trying to do is to protect you and the third thing we're trying to do is if if you get infected that you'll get infected at a lower dose and are less likely to develop severe symptoms or that's the three for here Okay. Doctor, a quick question. Um, one study that I thought was pretty interesting on the mask thing was about the U- USS Theodore Roosevelt, that outbreak. Uh-huh. Um, and 
it, it seemed to me to show two things. One, that the masks were the most effective safety precaution out of all the different options, including the social distancing and all of the other things, hand washing, sanitizer, all of that. However, on the other hand, it also showed they were nowhere near universally effective. Um, is did I, First of all, did I get that, that uh, right? And secondly, it, I think there's a problem with the media messaging on that, in that they're trying to make it seem like if you wear a mask, you're done. And people may very well not take other safety precautions because they think the mask right. is the end-all, be-all. Well, uh, you know, plus uh, you're on a warship and it's, you know, this social distancing is, a, you know, is impossible. Yeah. Um, you know, you go past people in tight quarters and tight corridors. It's, you know, there's no way. There's no way. And the other thing is that the masks they're using are, are plenty uncomfortable. And, you know, I think people took them off quite a bit. There's a, some new technology that's being um, sort of bandied about right now that I've seen for much more wearable masks that people can wear for longer periods of time. And actually have things like straw holes through them so you can drink and not have to take it off when you're on, like, flight deck operations. Mm. But, you know, the, you asked me earlier about N95s. N95s are great. Um, as long as you have one that does not have an exhaust valve on it. If you have an exhaust valve on it, which are these little kind of valves on the side or in the front, those um, basically uh, let out unfiltered air. So while you've protected yourself, if you're one of the people who's asymptomatically infected, you're not protecting anyone else. So if you're getting N95s, two things. One is make sure you get one without a valve. Uh, and the second thing is um, if you're really serious about it, it needs to be fit tested. And by fit testing, um, you know, somebody holds up some noxious smelling chemical and you can't smell it. That's that's what fit testing consists of. And if you have a beard or, you know, that sort of, you know, oh, so mm -hmm. elegant Miami Vice stubble, um, you're not going to be able to your mask isn't going to fit tightly enough to really uh, to provide, provide that much higher level of protection. In general, we reserve N95s for uh, hospital ICU, emergency department. EMT, police, those kinds of situations. Uh, one more really dumb one for me, doctor. Uh, they, they say all the time, um, you know, because the mask, they, they show these videos online where you're just speaking normally and there's all sorts of droplets you have no idea that are going out, which is really disgusting. And then they show the mask is a much, is a very effective form of source control, right? You're not spitting these droplets out as you speak all the time. What they never talk about though is, you know, what if I go to the grocery store and aren't constantly running my mouth to every single person I pass by. Uh, like, I, I, my wife does that all the time. I go into the grocery store and I pick the things up and I go in line. If you're not speaking, are you, are you in an, as far as a source control situation, are you in a danger of spreading all sorts of droplets if all you're doing is breathing through your mouth? Yes, but less so. I mean, think what your breath looks like in the wintertime when you're outdoors. Mm -hmm. Right? That, that's what we're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't talk to anybody in the grocery store. No, I just, I just <laughs> down, you know, go for the cantaloupe. I, you know? uh, if you if you talk and there's only one gallon of the ice cream that you like, it's gone. <laughs> it's it's gone. gone. You know? So yeah, it may be gone. Hey, uh, doctor, I know this has been uh, kind of a scary uh, uh, venture for you, and I hope that it uh, has proven to be the exact opposite of what you were afraid of. I, we have to stop. Uh, making everything into a religion uh, and just talk science and have honest questions and 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 not try to win just try to find out what the truth is and I appreciate you coming on thank you so much my pleasure you bet so let me go to uh, one more one more doctor and that is uh, dr. Carlin Borisenko she's an organizational psychologist she's you know a Forbes contributor etc cetera, etc cetera. she's now uh, part of our, uh, our our circle of friends and I ask her to look into because I think Stu weren't both doctors pretty much saying the same thing it was, it, yeah closer than you would have thought I mean they definitely had some yeah, I think I disagreement mean, on, on, on certain things but generally speaking they're saying yeah. They're somewhat effective, uh, but you still, you know, they're not universally effective. Yeah, exactly right. So, so Carlin, where is this, I'm going to spray you with pepper spray if you're not wearing one, outside? Where is this coming from? 
Well, I think, you know, to first to take a step back, I want to do a disclaimer and say, I am not a medical doctor. I am not speaking on the effectiveness of masks. But one of the things yeah, yeah, yeah. that has been very worrisome for me about the whole mask thing, and I said this was going to happen back in March, is it's it's dehumanizing to people. We're, we're literally stopped. We're not seeing each other as human beings when we're in this pro-mask versus anti-mask debate. Now, in some respects, that makes sense because the way our brain evolved, our survival mechanism, whether or not we're afraid that we're going to die, is the number one thing that we will make decisions on. And if we are afraid that we're going to die or be put in some sort of danger, that's going to kick off our fight or flight mechanism, which essentially is, you know, either you're going to fight the situation aggressively, which is what we see when we're seeing people pepper spray one another out in public when they could just easily socially distance, walk around, you know, separate themselves from mm-hmm. the people not wearing masks. Instead, they're fighting it aggressively, which is the fight uh, mechanism of that. The other option is, of course, to run away in the other direction, to flee from what you think is going to attack you. But, you know, what is striking about this for me, Glenn, because the last time I spoke with you, we talked about, you know, white fragility and all of that. And one of the things that I actually think is so interesting about um, what's going on with the masks, it is actually mirrors what they talk about in white fragility, which is if someone is saying that I don't feel comfortable wearing a mask for whatever reason, whether it's simply an emotional thing or it's actually a medical reason that they don't want to wear a mask that is an individual decision whereas you know what what they argue in white fragility is that individualism is bad white people are act as individuals and that's somehow bad and I, i almost feel as though it's become so politicized because the two issues have become incredibly conflated if you look at how people are speaking about these online you're going to see that People who are pro-mask usually tend to be more on the left. People who are anti-mask tend to be, though not exclusively, more on the right. And and I think that it's really, it's kind of like this perfect storm of nonsense that has descended onto the issue of mask, whereas what, what we could be doing is exactly what you just t- did, have a medical discussion where you're hearing from both sides about the effectiveness of it and approach the situation much more calmly than it's being approached right now.